oppressing. Hallelujah. Oppressing. And we just fell right in line with you. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. It is wonderful to be alive and to be alive in Jesus. It's the only reason. Only good purpose in life. Otherwise, you work, you eat, you drink, you be merry, and then tomorrow you die. But in the kingdom, we just live for the glory of God. And we keep on living because we got eternal life abiding within us. And the gates of hell can't do anything about it. Hallelujah. Glory. Father, we thank you for another wonderful, glorious night. We pray that you have received our heartfelt worship that came before you, entered into your very presence. We thank you for the angels that are assigned to us to watch over us, that assisted us even in our praise. We pray that you were blessed and glorified in our midst and for those that are watching online you stream and all that they are experiencing the same spirit which raised christ jesus from the dead and the same spirit that is here with us in all of his fullness even to the overflow that the joy of the Lord, which is our strength, is just bubbling up within us, breaking all shackles, destroying yokes, lifting burdens, causing the captive to be free. And we give you all the glory for everything that you've done, everything you're doing, and all that you're about to do in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. Before I go on, did the Lord give anyone a word by the Spirit of God that you believe is going to bless the body. If you do, raise your hand. If you, nobody has anything, we'll just keep on moving. I think we have some announcements coming up, uh, reminders anyways. October is just around the corner. Yeah, it is day after tomorrow. I think tomorrow is the 30th. And then we have October the 1st. Is that on a Friday? Yeah. Amen. And so I heard Minister Patton as he was praying about this last quarter, because the fourth quarter is the key quarter. You want to finish well. Doesn't matter what happened in the first, second, and third quarter. It's the fourth quarter that really matters. Whether you're going to come through this year victorious or defeated. We choose to be victorious. We know that we are in Christ, but we want to reign. We want to reign. Amen. We want to reign in victory all the way through. Feast of Tabernacles is a wonderful feast to celebrate because um, it's, it's like there's such an emphasis on the joy and the rejoicing. You just come through that uh, season of Rosh Hashanah, which is the beginning of the new year, and then you immediately go into 10 days of awe, of solemn repentance before God and before man, seeking forgiveness because you want this year as the word of god says he crowns the year with his goodness he crowned the year with his favor he crowned the year with his blessing and that's what you want for the entire year that the blessing and the favor of the lord be upon you that entire year and during those 10 days on that 10th day which is known as yom kippur and the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies and offer up blood, first of all, for himself 
and then for his family as well as the children of Israel. And after that, it was determined, your fate was determined the entire year based on those 10 days of what you did. And we as the body of Christ under the New Testament, New Covenant, you know, we should always live a, a life of consecration, of sanctification, of purification, walking before the Lord blameless, quick to repent of anything and everything that we've done wrong, and things that we aren't even aware of. Holy Spirit, reveal those things because we want nothing hindering us as we go through this daily life here on this earth. We want the favor and the blessing of God upon us, but more than that, we want what the Father's heart is, and that's souls to be saved and come into the knowledge of the truth, then do as Jesus instructed us, and that is go make disciples. Go make followers of Jesus even as we follow him. Follow me, the Lord Jesus Christ says, and teaching how to go about doing that because he gave us three things. Deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow him daily. Now, even though he was speaking to the generation of that day, he still speaks the same thing to us as his believers, as his brothers and sisters, as his body. We are connected to him. He is our head. We are his body in the earth. And to be about what Jesus wants to do, which is the Father's business, is what we as the disciples of the Lord ought to be doing. And he's going to bless us in everything that we do. Hallelujah. Glory. He's going to make it worth our while. So in just honoring the feast, not just to find something interesting to do, but to acknowledge it for what it really is. Dad's Holy Feast Days. It's an awesome, wonderful thing because we just let the Father know how much we do love him and appreciate him, and we celebrate what he celebrates. Hallelujah. A sinner comes to Jesus. There's rejoicing all in heaven. Dad rejoices. Jesus rejoices. The angels rejoice, and the Holy Ghost is here helping us to bring the souls into the kingdom. Glory be to God. And so there's just this celebration, but it's holy feast days that he selected, that he appointed and said, do this on this day just to be able to be a part of that is a wonderful thing. Hallelujah. And I just look forward to the wonderful things that the Lord has to do in and through us. Glory be to God. If you have your Bibles with you, for the short time that we have remaining, turn with me to John chapter 7. And we'll just take this as far as we get to tonight in the Spirit, by the Spirit. Before I get there, Father, we thank you for the word tonight. We thank you for what's about to be spoken. Think through my mind, speak through my mouth. I decrease that you can increase in me. I give you my body, my soul, my spirit, my mind that you can use for your glory in this moment that we have. In Jesus' mighty name, we thank you in advance. Amen. Uh, in John chapter 7, I'll just go with that. It's a chapter right after John chapter 6. But in John chapter 6, Jesus is, there's like six months between the two chapters, even though we read them consecutively. Um, and we might read it as if, okay, it's just ongoing, ongoing, which it is. But there's a period of six months in between these two chapters. In the conclusion of chapter 6, we see Jesus has lost a lot of membership. He has uh, shared with them 
that he is the manna from heaven, that the manna that the children of Israel forefathers had in the wilderness, they ate it, but they are dead, and that he is the bread of life, and he comes to give life to everyone who believes in him and follows him. And he said to them that his blood, they had to drink of his blood, they had to eat of his body and drink of his blood in order to be a part of him. And so many got turned off from that. We get towards the end in verse 63, I believe it is, Jesus says, the word that I speak to you, the word is spirit and it is life. And so some of them, even though they didn't understand it fully, they still followed him. But some of them, it was just too much for them to chew on. So they left him. So you're talking about six more months down the road, and Jesus doesn't have many followers at this point in time, but he has the 12 that have stayed with him, and one was a devil. So when Jesus said in John chapter 6, uh, do you want to go too? You guys want to leave me? Because if Jesus was selfish, if he lost sight of what his mission was, he would have felt bad about all of those that walked away from him and followed him no more. He would have got offended or hurt by it. But because he was not selfish and only thinking about himself, but strongly considering what the will of the Father was, he wasn't moved. So even the 12 that was with him, he's like, you want to leave too? Because he, it was a, he is about the Father's business, and it didn't matter, although the Father loves all and wants to save all, it didn't matter to him that they wanted to leave too. But Peter them said, no, Lord, because you hold the words of eternal life, paraphrasing. And so they hung with him. So he still got them, but the multitudes have abandoned him. Now we cross over into John chapter 7, and we look at verse 1, and it says, After these things, what things? Jesus walked in Galilee. So the way verse 1 opens up, you would think that, okay, this is all running together. But it's like, no, there's, there's a, 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 a gap in there of about six months. Jesus is still moving on, and Jesus is still, still doing the work of the Father. So it says, after these things, Jesus walked in Galilee, for he could not walk in Jewry or Judah, Judea because the Jews sought to kill him. So you got them wanting to kill him. You got people that didn't want to follow him. But did he stop doing what the Father wanted him to do? And that's just how determined we have to be as sons and daughters of the Most High God. So committed to the Father, so committed to his will, so committed to his purpose, that if everybody leaves you, if nobody likes you, if people are out to kill you, it doesn't have to be physical killing. It could be just assassination of character. If people want to talk about you like you're a dog or, you know, whatever, like you're less than a human being. You don't get moved by it. If people are racist, we'll say, which is a common thing that they use now in politics in order to get their way or make somebody feel guilty for something that they're not, and the ones who are actually saying it are the ones that are actually doing it themselves, but they use it as a weapon to get their way. And so... You have to be in the position that you're not going to let anybody or anything get in your way of doing what the will of the Father is. We live in a selfish society, a society that it's all about me. It's all about what I want to do. It's all about, you know, my best life right now, what I can get for me, that sort of thing. It's not like it's uncommon. It's a living reality. More people in the body and outside of the body are so consumed with themselves that they don't think about others or things that are more important than just them. You lose all of that stuff when you come to Christ. That's why he says, 
Let him deny himself or herself. Take up his cross. Paul said it best. I like it. I take it. I receive it. It's mine. Thank you. And I forgive everybody. But he said, for me to live is Christ and for me to die is gain. And that's the mindset that a believer needs to grow into, adapt, and claim for themselves that I'm alive for Jesus now. Doesn't matter what happens to me in life, but I am a, I'm alive for Jesus now. And it doesn't matter whether I have a thousand following me or just me following me, following Christ. You understand what I mean? It doesn't matter because we are set, we are fixed, we are focused, and we are confident in who we are and what we're about. When I shared with you out of 1 John about being born of God and constantly out of John chapter 3, being born from above, born of God, meaning we have his nature, we have his character, we have his life in us. And so because of that, born into a kingdom where I'm in the kingdom and the kingdom is in me, it becomes more of a living reality than what we see in the natural. And I hope all of that makes sense to you. You've heard it enough time and time again. You probably wonder, you know, wonder we're going to get something new. But this is so necessary for people because we end up reduce, we, 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 I shouldn't say reduce, we end up either forgetting about it or forsaking it altogether just to adapt to what's going on in everyday life. We must always remember now that we are from above. We must always remember that we're in the kingdom of God, that we don't see it in the natural, but in the spirit realm, it is so real that if we breathe our last breath here on earth, nobody has to be sad and sorrowful because we're going on into glory. Amen. For eternity, not for a short period, but for eternity, because everybody is going to have to live their life, and we will choose to live our own life, or we will choose to live the life that God has given us. And in everything that we do, it's to bring glory and honor to his name. So Jesus has multitudes following him. A pastor with a pastor's heart, a good shepherd with a good shepherd's heart, loves the flock of God. He or she does. And they lay down their lives for the flock. And if the sheep goes out into another pastor or goes out there back to the world, it hurts. I'll, I'll be perfectly transparent. It hurts, but we can never allow that hurt. And because we carry ourselves this way, some people think, oh, they're not even moved. Hurt, but still moving forward. That makes sense. It's not like we're not bothered or impacted or affected by the negative things that go on. It's just the greater calling in life is beyond that temporary moment. And we trust God to bring healing and wholeness everywhere that it hurts as we go. Because we know dad is going to take care of everything. I hope I'm being uh, plain enough. That's just being transparent. So when Jesus sees all of these people go, and he asked his disciples, are you going to leave me too? And they say, no, because you have the keys to eternal life. And it's like, okay, you can go with me now. You can go because you have identified yourself with me more than just the multitudes and what they think or what they say or even what they do. Because they might have just went ahead and followed the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the scribes and all. Or they may just have went back to their old ways. But the disciples remain with them, even the one 
that was a devil. And even with him, when he betrayed Jesus, he should have repented, but he was remorseful. When he saw that Jesus didn't walk away from those authorities or walk through the midst of the crowd, when he saw that Jesus was not going to break away from this, he felt remorse in his heart, but not enough to bring himself to repentance that he might get forgiven and then be saved. Judah perished. But here in chapter 7, he walked in, uh, after all these things, Jesus walked in Galilee, for he would not go or would not walk in Jewry because the Jews sought to kill him. Now the Jews' feast of tabernacles was at hand. Feast of Tabernacles is all about celebration and rejoicing. They have come off of the heels of Rosh Hashanah. They have come off of the heels of the Ten Days of Awe. They've come off of Yom Kippur. They did their repentance and all, and they have believed their fate was determined for this new year that they were in, and they should have been rejoicing. Remember what the Lord said? He's going to bless the increase, bless the work of the hands, and that people, not people, but we would bring him an offering. And in bringing him that offering, he's promised to bless us for the year. So they should have all been, all been excited about the time that they were in. But nevertheless, they had it in their minds to kill him. In verse 3, listen to this. His Brethren, therefore, said unto him, Depart hence, and go into Judea, that thy disciples also may see the works that thou doest. They were being sarcastic, but they didn't recognize Jesus for who he was and who he is until he died and rose from the dead. And then you find all of them with Mary in Acts chapter 1, in that upper room, waiting on the promise of the Holy Ghost. So they had sense enough to repent afterwards. But his brethren were disappointed at him, jealous of him, envious of him, and made statements like, go on out there, verse 4, for there is no man that doeth anything in secret, and he himself seeketh to be known openly. In other words, Jesus, you're just a selfish person. If thou do these things, show thyself to the world. Listen to this. For neither did his brothers, brethren, believe in him. Family. And so he's got to deal with this. So he's set on doing the Father's will. And Jesus is our examples, and we're called to be followers of him and not followers of man or followers of our, or just doing our own thing. I'll put it like that. For neither did his brethren believe in him. Verse 6, then Jesus said unto them, my time is not yet come, but your time is always ready. And here he goes. Because this is the difference between Jesus and even his own family, as well as those who were around him and those who left and abandoned him. He says, my time has not yet come, but your time is always ready. The world cannot hate you, but me it hateth, because I testify of it that the works thereof are evil. We have to be willing to call it as it is, as the people of God. Even in these difficult times where people are so confused, again, I go to Shaq. Shaq said, and he didn't go into all of the details, but he covered enough details to let you know that he doesn't want to be a part of that crowd known as a celebrity, as an elite, as one who's better than everybody else because they're wealthy and they've accomplished a lot and they look down on other people because they haven't ac uh, accomplished or um, uh, accumulated, is another word I was looking for, accumulated as much as they have. But listen to this because this is where the rubber meets the road. The world cannot hate you. 
but it hated me because I testify of it that the works thereof are evil. So if Jesus says that the world cannot hate you, but it hates him, and he tells them why it hates them, what was he saying about his brothers? Anybody, everybody, somebody. It's real simple. It's right there. Who said that? Minister Killings? Say it aloud. Say it aloud. Say it loud. Say it loud. Say it loud. Raised up. Same family. Same mother. Same father. Except Jesus had Father God as his father. But Joseph was his stepfather. They come up in the, under the same household, same learnings. Same Jewish tradition and patterns. And yet Jesus says to them, the world cannot hate you. And the reason the world cannot hate you is because you're just like the world. You are of the world. Mind you, raised up in a Jewish family, Jewish tradition, raised up. They know that their elder brother is serious about what he's doing. They think he's cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs or has gone off the deep end. But nevertheless, coming up under the same household, and Jesus tells them, the world cannot hate you, but me it hated because I testify of it that the works thereof are evil. So then he says, go ye up unto the feast. I go not up yet into this feast. For my time is not yet full come. And when he had said these words unto them, he abode still in Galilee. But when his brethren were gone up, then went he also up unto the feast, not openly, but as it were in secret. Now some say he came in secret because he did not want to be killed prematurely and all. Plus, it wasn't Passover. It is now Feast of Tabernacles. But nevertheless, Jesus didn't want to be associated with them because of what they and how they lived their lives. He's like, no, I'm different. Everybody say, I got to embrace my difference. Sometimes it brings about that separation because you're around those who are not of like precious faith or they're worldly and they don't understand you. And the only thing they can do is be a friend with you, but not believe in what you believe in. And the warning is, it's not my interpretation. It is the Spirit of God. The warning is, Paul says it like this, be not deceived. Evil Corruption corrupts good habits, good patterns, good manners, if you will. And so you're trying to live your life for God, and they're trying to live their lives for whoever or whatever themselves. Some are blatantly open about worship of, of, of devils, worship of Satan. Some are blatantly open. Some have lost their moorings. Some have lost their sense of identity as to who they are. And so you have a guy thinking that he's trapped, um, or uh, uh, how do they say it? A guy thinking that he's trapped. A guy who believes he's a woman trapped in a guy's body. That's, how, that's with clarity. Or a woman who believes she's trapped in a man's body. It's not condemnation, but it is forcing others to believe that way. I shared with you a couple of weeks ago, and I'm going to stop because we're almost out of time. A few weeks ago about the precursor to the, um, what was it? Of what's to come. Thank you. A precursor of what's to come. 
we see how they're handling the pandemic. People are being fired from their jobs because they will not take the vaccine. Basketball players, some of them will lose half their salary because of rules that have been made by mayors of cities that have determined that if you are not vaccinated, you cannot play in this facility. If you are not vaccinated, you can't even attend the basketball games or whatever sports, if you will. Not all the sports have joined in on that. But in basketball in particular, you can't go into those games and the players one in particular, Andrew Wiggins, who is stating his claim that he doesn't want to take it for religious purposes, but I really like what he told the media. I believe he told the media this. When they asked him about it, he says, it's none of your business. So he will lose if they hold this. I don't think they're going to be able to hold it. He will lose over $300,000 per game at the Chase Arena, which is their home court, if he does not take the vaccine, the pressure is on for people to take the vaccine. You have to have a card in order to show that you have been vaccinated in order to get in. We went to the restaurant this past Sunday and you could not go into the restaurant because you have to be vaccinated. You can eat outside or you can get food to go, but you cannot sit in that restaurant. The restaurant was empty. And these people don't care about what they're going to do to small businesses. And all this is about the separation from all of that mess and not being moved or not being, you know, hurt feelings and all because don't say, well, it's my religion. Say, because I'm a child of the Most High God and my convictions are that I don't want to receive that vaccine. You can say that you're a child of God and your convictions are to take the vaccine. And nobody's going to come against you or should come against you for that. But that doesn't mean that they should be able to force everybody. Because see, when the Antichrist starts to, when he arrives on the scene and starts to force people to take the mark of the beast, they will either take it or they will die. Right now, you could take the vaccine and you just won't, you'll, you'll be able to have access to restaurants or things like that. But if you don't take it, then you cannot take part in certain things. You follow me? So all of these things that are coming on the scene, I'll say this and then I'm done for tonight, that are coming on the scene are putting pressure on people to conform. They say, obey the science. We, we trust the science, we obey the science, but they lie. And then they force science to agree with what they want in order to mandate and control people to make them do what they want, even though they don't do it or practice it themselves. How many more times do we have to see these politicians, whether they are ha at a, a nightclub or whether they are at a restaurant or whether they're doing something else in a crowd of people, a fundraiser with a crowd of people, none of them have masks on. But when they're on television and they're having a news conference or something, you find them with their mask on. It's a joke. And we have to be comfortable in our skin as to who we are in Christ and not bend or bow to the pressure that they're trying to put on us, especially when it comes to our convictions of who we are as children of God and not be moved by the pressure that will come. So now with Andrew Wiggins, I don't know about you, but $300,000 per game, that's a lot of money. That is a lot of money to give up. And I admire him for his stance. 
because when it comes down to it, that's like 30-something million dollars a year he would make, and he'll only get half of that. And he's still taking a stand. Now, that's still a lot of money, $15 million. But nevertheless, it's like he's taking a stand. And then you have other athletes that come out and say, get the, get the vaccine or be released. That's like Christian saying, take the mark of the beast. Take it. Jesus, the world hates me because I tell it that it's evil. But the world cannot hate you because you do what they want you to do. And that's exactly how it is with some of these now, that um, we're so divided on doctrine, we're so divided on uh, what we can and what we cannot do and things of that nature. And it's like, my God, if you have a problem with tongues, read the Bible and see what it says. But don't come against those who actually believe in tongues and have experienced it. You understand me? And so you have to not feel like, oh, we may be doing something wrong, or oh, maybe it's not right. Maybe we should, oh, maybe what Paul said, maybe we're doing this and that wrong. It's like, no, we have confidence in what we believe, and we're moving full force at it. And we're not going to try and comfort people who will accuse us of being in error when we know that we have the scripture that tells us we're doing what's right, what is okay, and what is pleasing in the eyesight of God. And we're not going to be moved by the numbers that we have or the numbers that we don't have. We just have to be confident in what we believe. And eventually, we're going to hit pay dirt. Because all of this stuff is exposing things. I said this before. COVID exposed a lot of weaknesses in the body and outside of the body. You even having, have secular that admit the same thing. Because of the pandemic and how people behave or respond or react to it. And it's like, we have to be the same whether it's COVID or whether it's any other pandemic or whether it's uh, uh, persecution, or whether it's just resistance. I don't like you, I don't like you, I don't like you. Okay? God loves me, and that's all that really matters. Amen. And I'm not here to please you, but I'm here to please him. Stand to your feet. For neither did his brother brethren believe in him. That's in John chapter 7, verse 5. But he wasn't moved because there was a greater calling. There was a there was a mandate given to him from God the Father that was more important than people receiving him or rejecting him. Receiving him was the intent, but even if they rejected, because the scripture says he was rejected by his own. He came to his own, and his own didn't receive him. But what did he do? He went to those who received, and it says, as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become sons of God even to those who believed on his name. This is who we are. Hallelujah. Embrace it proudly for the glory of God. Father, we thank you for this night and this time. We thank you for what you did during our time in praise and worship. Again, we pray that it was acceptable to you. We thank you for the richness of your word. And Lord, you give grant understanding and just keep us growing and glowing and flowing with you. May the Lord our God bless you, keep you, make his face shine upon you, be gracious unto you, lift up his countenance on you and give you his peace. His name be over you and your household that he may bless you. 
that you may enjoy the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Above all else, you may prosper and be in health, even as your soul prospers, that the gates of hell will not prevail against you, but you'll conquer the gates of hell because of who you are and whose you are. In Jesus' name, amen. If you want to bring an offering, you can do so. The offering basket will be at the altar. Other than that, we shall see you on Sunday, if not 